how to start trusting again after being burned. I was in love. She was my wife, and I thought she was my best friend. Debbie and I had been married for six years when I learned that it was all an illusion. We were living in Portland at the time. Debbie had recently taken a job as an internal auditor for the largest real estate firm in the city, and I was in sales for a national machine tool manufacturer. Given my product line, I was rarely in the city center. Most of my clients were in the suburbs or remote areas of western Oregon, but this day found me in town with an extra two hours to spare. I called Debbie, invited her to lunch, and was disappointed when she told me she needed to finish a spreadsheet before an important meeting that afternoon. I didn't want to miss the opportunity, so I went to Jake's for a plate of crawfish etouffee. I enjoyed the nut brown sauce with my rice while listening to the women at the table behind me and wondering how they did it. All four women seemed to speak at the same time. This is not the first time I have witnessed this phenomenon, and it has always puzzled me. Men cannot do this. I sat there smiling to myself, trying to understand how anyone could understand this gibberish when something one of the ladies said stuck in my head. The lady's question intrigued not only me, because the other three women at the table immediately fell silent. So, Deborah Miller is messing with Simon Walker? This question immediately caught my attention because my wife's name is Deborah. She uses this name in her professional life. Only family and friends call her Debbie. And Miller is the name she has been with me since we got married. My name is Mark Miller, by the way. One of the ladies asked, Why are you so sure that you know? The first one replied, I was sitting in Deborah's office when her husband called her. She refused his invitation, under some excuse that she was working during her lunch break. Five minutes later, Simon looks into her office and asks if she's ready. She nodded at Simon and then blushed and looked at me. She was obviously embarrassed to have heard her lie to her husband. My heart sank at her words, but my ears remained alert while the other ladies continued this stream of gossip. It didn't take Simon long to sink his fangs into another married woman, did it? Deborah has only been in the office for a month. And it's only been two months since Heidi Johnson left. I heard that her husband forced her to leave after he found out about her affair with Simon. Can you imagine a mother of two preschoolers falling in love with Simon's bag of lies? What is his secret? You mean, besides those big blue eyes, Ryan Gosling's face, and, from what I hear, a pretty good endowment down there? All four women started laughing. I had heard enough, so I paid the bill in cash and went to the car. The rest of the day passed in a blur, trying to figure out how I could confirm my worst fears. If Debbie cheated on me, we're screwed. So would I hire a private investigator to follow her? Or were there other ways to do this? For all this, I called Debbie's office and pretended to be a salesperson. The administrator kindly informed me that Mrs. Miller was not at home and would return at two o'clock. I tried so hard to keep my fingers crossed that the gossip was unfounded. When Debbie returned home that evening, I tried my best to act normal, although I almost lost my temper when she apologized for not being able to have dinner with me. She even had the nerve to kiss me on the cheek while apologizing. She asked if I mind making dinner because she wanted to soak in the bath for a while before we sat down to dinner. She poured herself a glass of wine and headed into the master bath. This was probably her way of cleaning up the evidence. Coming home and taking a shower would have been too obvious. Debbie was smart enough to use the bathtub as a disguise. How many more nights did she use this trick? I quickly prepared a salad and a tray of cheese and crackers and headed to the bath. I undressed in the bedroom and entered the bathroom completely naked. Debbie nearly jumped out of her skin when I walked into the bathroom and started getting into the tub. Mark, what are you doing, trying to scare me to death? Well, if you remember Deb, I live here too. Just thought we could share the hot water. Debbie has a cue when she is lying or takes time to answer a question. She doesn't know she has it, and I never told her about it. I've seen this from time to time. Just last week I saw her tell when a good friend of ours asked Debbie if she liked her new hairstyle. Debbie blinked twice and then told her friend that she absolutely loved it. Debbie let her speak before answering me. I was just leaving because I was absolutely hungry. 
Is supper ready? You've probably guessed that Debbie uses words like absolutely. Before Debbie had a chance to wrap the towel around herself, I did my best to examine her. No telltale bite marks, etc., and I couldn't get a good look at her shaved crotch without it being obvious. As the water was leaking from the bathtub, I thought about taking a sample of the water and getting it tested, but had no idea how to do it. Catching Debbie turned out to be incredibly easy. That night, I downloaded a self-published book called The Amateur Detective onto my Kindle. Catching a Cheating Spouse It only took me a couple of hours to read the basics, and the next morning, I finished two assignments while Debbie was in the shower. First, I checked Debbie's calendar on her smartphone. Yesterday at noon, Debbie blocked out two hours with the note, Work until lunch. I noticed that on the previous Thursday, the same two hours were blocked with the same note. How clever of her. The second task was to download a tracking app to her phone. It was too easy, and after thinking about it, I checked my phone. What a bitch. I had a similar app on my phone. I quickly deleted the app from Debbie's phone. There is no point in raising your hand too early. I saved the application on my phone. It may come in handy in the future. Every morning I checked her calendar. Tuesday morning turned out to be a good one. Between noon and two there was a note. Work until lunch. After breakfast, I went to my office and did my best to get something done. On my way to work, I picked up my phone at Walmart. At 11 a.m., I forwarded my regular phone to the new phone and left my regular phone on the table. If Debbie checks the tracking app she has installed on my phone, it will show that I am sitting 20 miles from her office. If she called me, I could answer the phone. I arrived downtown in 15 minutes and checked into the Starbucks across from her office building. At the stroke of noon, she walked out the front doors with a man. Damn, he actually looked like Ryan Gosling. I left Starbucks to follow them. This may sound crazy, but following the advice in the book, I wore a baseball cap, sunglasses, and a small rock in my right shoe to help me change my stride. None of that mattered because the two lovebirds only had each other's attention as they walked hand in hand one block to the lobby of the vintage hotel. I decided I had almost two hours, so I went across the street to the bank and started transferring some money, closing our mutual credit card accounts and home equity account. Debbie and I also had credit cards in each of our names. She will find out about the closed accounts later, when it no longer matters. I also called my company's law firm and received a recommendation for a divorce attorney. I called her office and made an appointment for the next day. With half an hour left, I returned to the hotel lobby. I waited in the lobby, trying to keep a low profile, pretending to read the Wall Street Journal but actually watching the elevator doors as the two of them descended. I woke up. Debbie. Debbie stared at me with a shocked expression. Mark. God. No. Simon was ready to play the hero because he stood between me and Debbie and started saying something about being careful, holding out his hand like some damn traffic cop. I think Debbie forgot to tell him about the boxing class I was taking, because he didn't seem ready when my fist went into his stomach just below his solar plexus. He knelt down. Debbie just stood there, still moving her mouth like a damn fish. Before she could say a word, I told her, Maybe it's best to leave the room for the night, because I don't want you coming home tonight and maybe ever again. Unfortunately, right after I got home that day, a squad car pulled up and when I opened the door, I was handcuffed and taken to the Multnomah County Jail and booked for assault. Simon pressed charges. As a result, I spent the night in prison, and the next day I was released due to my own intelligence. When I got home, it was obvious that Debbie was in the house because most of the small and valuable things, including the watch my father left me when he died, were gone. I checked the closet and found that Debbie's clothes were also missing. Good riddance. I still had time to shower and catch a meeting with my lawyer. Over the next three months, the following happened and not in any particular order. The charges against me were dropped because I was lucky. The front desk clerk told the officers that Simon had assaulted me and she saw him raise his hand. To her, it looked like he was ready to attack me. I think she was the kind of person who was happy to see any creep who entertained a married woman get his due. She wasn't actually lying, 
She was simply interpreting Simon's actions in my favor. I only communicated with Debbie through our lawyers. She tried, can't we do this? I firmly said no, and the divorce papers went through the system. When I refused to agree to counseling, Debbie flew into a rage and tried to get over half of our community assets, child support, etc. My luck continued after Debbie because my lawyer argued that even though we lived in a no-fault state, I shouldn't have to suffer the consequences of her actions. The judge was swayed. My lawyer took a unique approach. She revealed that while Debbie had the opportunity to write her own vows, she agreed to traditional vows that included leaving all others, so I expected fidelity. Secondly, we had testimony from Debbie's colleague about a conversation in Debbie's office when she declined my lunch invitation in order to have lunch with Simon. Third, you could hear a pin drop when it hit the court. Debbie took my father's watch while I was in jail. The judge tried her best to keep a neutral expression as she listened to this testimony, but she was clearly impressed. Even Debbie's lawyer cringed when the statement was read in court. I got a divorce and my watch back. Debbie and I shared everything we had accumulated during our marriage, and she did not receive any alimony. Debbie asked for one more, and she was granted. She asked to meet with me before the final paperwork was signed, sealed, and delivered. What the hell? I agreed, at least out of curiosity. So we sat down in her lawyer's office, and she started talking nonsense about how much she loved me, how sorry she was for falling into Simon's trap, and how she thought we were a great couple with a great future. When I heard enough, I decided to bluff. Debbie, tell me about the others. Debbie blinked twice before answering, Mark, since we've been together, I've never been with another man, absolutely honest. I shook my head. Goodbye, Debbie. This must have made Debbie very angry because three weeks later I received the CD in the mail. It's hard to believe. I always thought Debbie was a pretty smart woman, but on the CD there was a tape of Debbie and Simon having sex. It all started with a fully clothed Debbie looking straight into the camera. Mark, this is for you. Eat your heart out. The entire video was only 15 minutes long, but it was one of the hottest 15 minutes I've ever seen. I seriously considered sending links to the site to Debbie's parents, friends, and employer, but ultimately decided to de-escalate the war. I never told Debbie about the Tumblr account, but I did send her an email warning her that more videos like this would end up on her dad's computer screen. Debbie actually... Debbie responded with an apology and a lame explanation that she was still hurt by how it all ended and that she was trying to make me jealous. She promised to stop. I'm a pretty stoic guy. I'm sure most people who know me even think I'm a little cold. After the divorce, and even after watching the video, I didn't cry, I didn't spend a week drunk, and I didn't think about eating my gun. I was sad because Debbie had been my best friend for the six years we were married. Her betrayal deprived me of all trust in other people. If you start to think that people are untrustworthy, you will begin to see this in your daily interactions with people. I'm pretty sure my college psychology classes called this a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, when the bartender or salesman gave me change for 10 instead of my 20, I decided that they were trying to scam me. Little things like this turned me into a cynic. My job in sales didn't help either because it's such a brutal environment. As for women, I had my usual routine, chasing skirts and hanging out in bars, some kind of lonely existence, until I met. A year after my divorce, I met Becky at a dinner party thrown by some clients. Becky was beautiful, with green eyes, blonde hair, a body that would be on the cover of a Victoria's Secret catalog, and most importantly, the personality of a woman you would be proud to take home to meet your family. Her smile and laughter could light up a room, and they definitely lit me up. At this dinner party, I did everything I could to be the most charming and most interesting person in the world so I could sell Mexican beer that night, if only I could sell myself to this lady. As we were about to call it a night, I approached Becky and asked if I could take her out to dinner the following weekend. How can I say no, she asked. You worked so hard tonight to make me want to say yes. That effort should be rewarded. Is it obvious? 
Yeah, but I think it's cute. I also asked our hostess what she thought about you, and she said you have potential, so let's go next Friday and find out. After two months of dating, we decided to become exclusive, but we took our time and maintained separate residences, although we spent four to five nights a week together. Every single one of my friends fell in love with her. And best of all, I started to fall in love with Becky and felt that she might fall in love with me. Sex began immediately after the promise of exclusivity. A gentleman should not kiss and tell. But without going into too much detail, I will say that it was the best sex of my life to that point. Nothing was off limits to her as long as it was limited to what two people could do with each other. We had fun in and out of bed. Yes, I started to think that this was my ticket to happiness. And then the bottom fell out. My clue that something might be wrong came one day when Becky and I took time off from work early one morning and were hanging out drinking beer. Becky's phone rang. She looked at the reading and ignored the call. This was unlike her. She usually answered the phone and told someone she would call back later. After my ignorance with Debbie, I became more observant and suspicious. I had no intention of playing the happy cuckold role again. Later that evening, I had the opportunity to take her phone and look through her call list. At 3.30 a.m., she missed a call from someone listed in her contacts as J.R. Looking through the call log, I found several calls between the two of them. I then went to Becky's calendar and found that she had an appointment with J.R. the next day at 1 bus p.m. It's time to find your baseball cap, sunglasses, and shoe stone again. On Thursday afternoon, I was at the sandwich shop across the street from Becky's office building. She left the building alone and headed north on Broadway before entering the Marriott. As soon as I entered the lobby, Becky and a man walked up to the front desk and were talking to the front desk clerk. I couldn't believe my eyes. How could this happen to me again? When I approached the two of them, I almost felt sick. You're cheating on me, you lying bitch! Becky turned around and looked at me. I don't think the look on her face would have been different if I had shot her with a gun. The man she was with looked at me and asked, Who is this? Before Becky could answer his question, a second man with a Marriott name tag approached. He stared at the three of us in confusion, but before anyone could say a word, Becky ran out of the lobby. Everything happened too quickly, but I read the second man's badge. Greg Houston, catering manager, and then looked back at the first man. The first man broke the silence. I understand. You are Mark. I'm John Riley, the man Becky hired to coordinate your surprise 30th birthday party here at the Marriott. I think you just ruined everything. After that day, Becky never called me back. A week later, I woke up to find on the porch in front of my townhouse a box of things I had left in her apartment. Inside was a note that simply said, I don't want anything I left at your house. Give it all to charity. Becky. Over the next six months, I panicked. I ate, slept, and went to work. One afternoon, I decided to go out and attend the annual Portland Craft Beer Festival that was taking place on the waterfront. I was just lucky to meet Becky there. She was with a guy, and they were clearly a couple. After introducing us, Becky asked if she could talk to me. To his credit, her boyfriend said yes. Mark, I'm sorry I never spoke to you again, but at that moment I was so hurt and so angry. That night I called my mother and she told me that you are spoiled and running for your life. I listened to my mother's advice and left you alone. Becky, I wish I could be mad at you for how it ended, but unfortunately, I think your mother is right. Debbie's betrayal hurt me more than I imagined. I deserve it. I was an ass. Mark, get help. You are too good a person to live the rest of your life alone because one person betrayed your trust. Find someone who can help you, be it a counselor, a priest, or someone else. I'm sorry I couldn't help you, but I'm not the person to make you whole again. We almost had something. Thanks for the advice. I think you're right. I need to pull myself together. Thank your boyfriend for giving us the opportunity to speak out. You deserve a guy who trusts you enough to do this. Say hi to your mom for me and tell her what I said. She raised a beautiful woman, and her instincts were right. We walked away from each other, and I saw moisture in her eyes. I had to quickly turn around before she saw my tears. So where do you go when you need to re-sync and get your life back on track? 
Where should I have gone when my marriage ended? I took three weeks off and went home to Chicago. Time to play the prodigal son. Mom still lived in the house we grew up in on the north side of town. I was the only one of her children to move out of the area, so she wasn't alone. My older sister had two children, and my younger brother had three. I teased him that his wife was a regular baby machine. Three kids before his 30th birthday. Mom was busy with five grandchildren, but I knew she missed me, although I can't figure out why, since she always claimed that I was the reason for her gray hair. On our second day in town, my mother invited my siblings and their families to a big feast. She served my favorite dish, homemade lasagna, and my favorite dessert, chocolate cheesecake. Like I said, all sorts of things about the prodigal son. I played the long-lost uncle and gave each of my nieces and nephews some expensive electronic gifts that most of them were too young to use. You could see their parents' eyes roll at my stupidity, but I think they appreciated the sentiment. After everyone left, my mother and I washed the dishes together and had a chance to chat. Mom wasn't one to give advice. It was always Dad's job, but Mom always knew what to do. Your buddy Hank Taylor still stops by from time to time. He asks, how are you doing? When was the last time you talked? Not as often as we should, and before you say it, yeah, it's probably my fault that we don't communicate more often. Call him. Hank was my best friend, from the moment we met in kindergarten until I left for college. From K-12, we were inseparable. In Little League, he was a pitcher, and I was a catcher. For six years of football, he was a quarterback, and I was his receiver. I quit baseball my freshman year because I was a mediocre hitter at best. And the track coach noticed my aptitude for the pole vault and high jump in gym class. I quit football after my freshman year because my father was afraid I would get injured and ruin my chances of getting a college track scholarship. In my junior year, I was one of the top high school pole vaulters in the country, and the University of Oregon was going to recruit me. My father's decision to keep me out of football had a negative impact on Hank's life. Our football team just missed out on announcing our junior year. Much of our success was due to the Taylor-Miller combination. I was Hank's number one target. His senior year was a down year. Most receivers had glass hands, and his statistics weren't good enough to earn him a college football scholarship. He received a baseball scholarship to Southern Illinois and excelled. Hank knew my father and his influence on my decision. He was never mad at me for leaving football. I got into UO and was on my way to the Olympics when a terrible accident ended my pole vaulting career. During warm-ups at the NCAA Finals, my pole broke in two, which is a one-in-a-million occurrence. I fell at an awkward angle and hurt my knee so badly that it took two years of therapy to get back to 90%. By that time, the Olympics were already over, and I received my bachelor's degree. I also had a quarter of a million in the bank after the pole manufacturer settled. With me at Oregon and Hank at SIU, we started to grow apart. I was one of his friends when he married Janice, and the last time I was home was after Janice gave birth to her second son. It had been a little over two years since I last saw Hank, and if he was angry at my carelessness, he didn't show it. Thirty minutes after I called his house, we were sitting in his backyard drinking beer. First, I learned what was going on in Hank's life. His job, a Chicago firefighter, his wife, Janice, and his two sons, Mark and Hank. Then it was my turn. Hank heard about my divorce from my mom, but she didn't share the details. He was less surprised by these events than I expected. He was surprised when I told him how my relationship with Becky ended and how I had trust issues. After Debbie cheated on me, it became difficult for me to trust anyone. It just seems like it's every man for himself. Hank stared at me before answering. It's because you've been hanging out with the wrong people for the last 12 years. Let me tell you a story you don't know. For the three years you and Ginny dated in high school, I had a crush on Ginny. Yes, I can see from the look on your face that you had no idea. And that's how it should be. A friend never messes with a friend's lady, no matter what. Remember that trip to my uncle's cabin in Door County? You had to work on Friday and the girl I was going out with at the time was Stacy. Ginny and I went to the cabin on Friday morning to get everything ready, and you and Stacy will come over Friday evening after work. Your car broke down 
and you didn't get there until late on Saturday night. So Ginny and I are going to be alone all night because we got a call saying you're stuck in Milwaukee, we're drinking cheap wine, Ginny is still in one of her bikinis from swimming in the lake, and to top it off, there's a blackout in the cabin electricity, and now we are sitting by candlelight. And you want to know what happened that night between me and Ginny? Nothing, because a friend never crosses that line. And if I hadn't been a friend and tried to attack Ginny, do you know what would have happened? Nothing. Because Ginny was the kind of girl who would never cheat on her man. You went to Oregon and left people you could count on to follow your Olympic dream. That's okay, but you shouldn't have replaced your friends with self-centered grabbers. I feel sorry for you, Mark. It took me a few seconds to process what Hank had said. Then I thought about Ginny. Do you have any idea where Ginny is and what she's up to? I haven't seen her since the first Christmas when I came home my freshman year at Oregon. Ginny was here a couple of months ago. Now she is a widow with a five-year-old son. Widow? What's happened? Her husband's last tour to Afghanistan. He was shot. She didn't go into detail. But I understand that he won several important medals for bravery, unfortunately, posthumously. Ginny tries to hang in there for the sake of their son, but you can tell she's barely holding it together. She still lives in San Diego County, close to the base, and his fellow officers are looking out for her. She'll probably be happy to hear from you if you're interested in her email. Is she still sexy? Did anything happen between you two while she was in town? When I asked for this, I looked over my shoulder to make sure Janice couldn't overhear our conversation, but the storm door was closed. You didn't listen, Mark. What the hell happened to you? First of all, I would never change Janice. Secondly, Ginny would never have sex with a married man. That's just not who we are. I need to get my head out of my ass. Only Hank Taylor could talk to me like that. That evening I sent a letter to Ginny. Ginny Hank Taylor gave me your email address. I hope it is not inappropriate for me to contact you, but I will be in the San Diego area this weekend and was wondering if I could invite you and your son to lunch or dinner on Friday or Saturday. Just to catch up. Warm regards, Mark. Early Tuesday morning, I received a pleasantly unexpected response to my email. It's great to hear from you after all these years. Friday lunch is good for me and my son Kevin. My address. I will expect you at noon unless I receive a different answer from you. Your friend, Ginny. Hank had been on duty since Tuesday, which meant he would be at the firehouse until I left town. But he invited me to tour the station and have lunch with his team. I accepted his offer and sat at the table with the actors later that day. It's still hard for me to explain the feelings I felt as I sat between two of Hank's fellow firefighters. They were both willing to answer my questions. They were probably used to civilians being sensitive to what they considered routine. The need for trust to perform one's tasks when fighting a fire became apparent. The only way each firefighter dared to enter a burning building was to realize that their teammates would have each other's back and get the job done. It was probably then that I began to realize that my life had gone downhill. Back in high school, I replaced baseball and football, two team sports, with individual track and field events. Although the overall performance of the track team depended on others, my contribution was based solely on my efforts. Even the profession I chose, sales, was similar to this. Whether I made a sale or not depended almost entirely on my efforts. The only team achievement I could point to since I was 15 was my marriage to Debbie. I flew into San Diego on Thursday, rented a car, and checked into Coronado. On Friday, I drove north to Ginny's house, one of the apartments in a four-unit townhouse. I called and waited, trying to hide a bouquet of flowers from a nosy neighbor. I almost dropped the flowers when the door opened. My God, Ginny was more beautiful than she was at 19. She was wearing a bright blue sundress and had a little boy wrapped around one of her legs. Mark, welcome. She put her hands behind my head and kissed my cheek. This is for me, she said, pointing to the flowers. It was a stupid question, but I think she was trying to get me to say something because I was still standing there, frozen. I responded by handing her the bouquet. Thank you, Mark. Please come in while I put them in the water. Mark, this is my son, Kevin. Kevin, this is Mr. Miller, an old friend who I went to school with before I met your dad. 
Kevin extended his tiny hand and said, Hello, Mr. Miller. Finally, I found my voice and said, Hi, Kevin, shaking his hand. While Ginny was putting flowers in a vase, I looked around the apartment. The first thing that caught my attention was the folded flag in the center of the bookcase. On one side of the flag was a photograph of a Marine. Attached to the frame were two medals, a purple heart and a navy cross. It's my father. I looked at the photo from the other side of the flag. Ginny with her husband and baby Kevin on the beach. At that moment, Ginny entered the room. Ginny, I'm sorry if something is wrong, but this is a beautiful photo. You three look very much in love. You must miss him. No need to apologize. It's a pleasant memory. And yes, we were madly in love. I met him at Northwestern University. He was in the ROTC program when I was studying journalism. My classmates wondered why I fell in love with a military man. Most of my classmates had little respect for the army. But in addition to being strong and confident, Chuck was someone you could count on and had a heart of gold. And again, that word is trust. Ginny's eyes watered slightly as she looked at the photo, so I broke the silence. Are you still going to have lunch? Yes, we need to make it. Come on, Kevin. Mr. Miller will take us to Red Robin. Kevin was very encouraged by this, and we got into Ginny's car instead of moving the car seat into the rental car. During the drive, the conversation became more upbeat, and by the time we entered the restaurant, the three of us were laughing at some stupid joke, Kevin told us. Lunch was wonderful. Although since we last spoke, Ginny has gone through so many changes in her life. Marriage, child, widow. She was still the same. Kind, smart, cheerful, and charming. At one point, Ginny asked me why I was in San Diego. I was embarrassed, but I decided to tell the truth. I told you about how both my mother and Hank scolded me. So, the truth is that I came here to apologize to you for the way I ended things back then. You deserve better and were completely honest listening to you tell me about your marriage. You did much better. What are you going to do now? Are you going back to Portland? My flight is not until Sunday evening. I think I'll spend the next couple of days on the beach, running and trying to recover. I have a lot to think about. Kevin relieved his boredom by coloring with the crayons the restaurant provides for the children while the two adults were engrossed. But two hours later, we went back to Ginny's. Mark, would you like to go to a barbecue at my friend's house tomorrow? What, and skip the day contemplating your navel? You're asking a lot. Ginny laughed. Well, if you change your mind and decide to go to the barbecue with us, pick me up tomorrow at 11. Dress casually in shorts and a polo shirt. Oh yeah, bring some beer. I told Ginny I would, kissed her on the cheek, and shook Kevin's hand. As I drove back to my hotel, all the reasons why I loved Ginny for three years in high school came back to me. The next day, Ginny, Kevin, and I went on a picnic. Ginny was wearing white shorts and some kind of t-shirt with a bra. The shorts weren't too short for a family picnic, but they showed off the shape of her athletic legs. The top just hinted at her cleavage, sexy but discreet. She pulled her blonde hair into a ponytail. Aviator sunglasses hid her brown eyes. After we parked the car, Ginny took my hand to introduce me to her friends. As we approached a small group of men, apparently Marines, I felt them studying me. And I got the feeling that this outing was partly a test to see if I was good enough to date Ginny. We met and Ginny left me to make sure Kevin was around the other kids. At least that's the reason she gave me. I said to the group, I hope this is not a cliche, but thank you for your service. Captain John Clayton was in charge of the group. It doesn't matter whether it's corny or not, it's always nice to hear. My father served in Vietnam, and I see the joy in his eyes when we walk together. I'm in uniform, and someone thanks me. Not at all like his experience after returning from Nam. Then the conversation moved on to more pleasant topics, including a courageous icebreaker, a sports one. The day passed quickly. I spent some time with Ginny, some time with the men, and even spent an hour in the kitchen with the ladies swapping cooking tips. At the end of the day, I was invited to join the men at the local tavern after bringing Ginny home. Kevin was asleep in his car seat. Well, did I pass? 
I think so, but Doreen will probably call me after you leave for the tavern. I'll get another call tomorrow after the men report to their wives tonight. I hope you don't mind too much. It's a close-knit group that looks out for each other. I'll always be a part of it because Chuck, he and John Clayton were very close in Afghanistan. I held my breath and decided to ask the question that was running through my head. So, the fact that I'm being tested means you want to keep dating me? Yes, Mark. We've both changed since high school, but I still have something in my heart for you. If you want to continue seeing me, I would really like that. I'd like that too, Ginny. Let's start checking. We laughed, and I remembered how much I loved the sound of her laugh. It will probably be late when I leave the bar. Can we see each other tomorrow, that is, if I pass the tests? Ginny laughed again. I usually go to Mass at ten. You can join me for Mass or come later. She looked me in the eyes. When was the last time you went to Mass, Mark? Besides, funerals and weddings, at least ten years have passed. I slowly left the church when I moved to Oregon. I didn't stop believing. I just stopped going to church. We drove up to her house. I carefully lifted Kevin out of the car seat and carried him to bed. I turned around and saw Ginny in the doorway, looking at us with a smile on her face. I went up to her, hugged and kissed her. She kissed me back. See you tomorrow. I'll be here at 9.30. Wish me good luck. I walked into the bar and was greeted by five men, including John Clayton. The bartender poured me a pint, and the six of us sat down at a table. John was obviously the leader here, so he started the business. Mark, we're not trying to make your life difficult, but you have to understand that the three of us at this table, including myself and the bartender Roddy, all owe our lives to Chuck Turner. Did Ginny tell you anything? About it? No. I saw the Navy Cross and knew it had to be something special, but I didn't want to get involved, so I didn't say anything. Well done, showing respect. I will tell you. We were on patrol in the mountains near Pakistan when we were ambushed by about 40 Taliban insurgents. We couldn't call for an airstrike because it would cause an avalanche. We couldn't retreat because they would hold the high ground and beat us off. Chuck ordered us to flank them while he and Rodriguez remained in position to bring them in. It took us three hours in this rough terrain to advance to the rear Taliban. Chuck and Roddy kept them busy for three hours. We managed to flank, and being on high ground, we were able to destroy them. But by the time we reached Chuck and Roddy, both were wounded. Chuck had four wounds and was still fighting. He died in my arms. Roddy was unconscious with wounds to his head and leg. Roddy has a prosthetic leg, so he works as a bartender and is not on active duty. That's why Ginny is our responsibility. At least until someone comes along and relieves us of responsibility. Someone worthy. I understand, John. Let me answer you this way. Ask Ginny if I ever did anything disrespectful in the three years we were together. My worst sin was letting her go, but I think it worked out better for her because she met Chuck and they had a son. I didn't have the maturity to be a good husband or father back then. I have never touched a woman in anger even when I caught my first wife with another man. I may not have what you have, the courage to attack the men shooting at you, but I am not a coward either. I wouldn't back down if it meant protecting the person I love from harm. I recently realized that I am a little self-centered, but I will work on it. So now that I know how things are, let me ask you all. I stopped to look around the table. Do I have your permission to continue dating Ginny? People might think it's a bit over the top to ask permission to date an adult, but I saw it as a way to show respect for their obvious concern for a Freen's widow. I wasn't pretending but I'm a good salesman because I'm pretty good at reading people. And it was the right question because the answer was a wide smile from John and the others. Roddy, can you bring us something tasty? Let it be Knob Creek. Rodriguez brought seven glasses, half filled with amber liquid. John raised his glass to make a toast. Captain Chuck Turner Rodriguez joined us and we all touched glasses and drank. We stayed for a couple more hours, drinking slowly to avoid getting drunk but covering a variety of topics. At some point, I was told why Ginny wasn't dating anyone right now. John told me all the information. Ginny and another Marine started getting serious last year. 
The problem was that Ginny couldn't take another Marine seriously, especially after losing her first husband, and Tom lived his whole life wanting to be a Marine. Tom told Ginny that he would leave the Marines, and Ginny told Tom that if he did, she would never speak to him again. Tom transferred to Lejeune right after that, and Ginny hasn't been serious since then until she received your letter. Doreen said she called that day, honestly excited about your visit. Don't say what I told you. I won't say anything, but thanks for sharing. The next day, my affair with Ginny began. I racked up some serious Alaska air-frequent flyer miles flying between Portland and San Diego, every weekend spent with Ginny and Kevin. Hotel rooms were more expensive than airfare, and Ginny wasn't ready for us to consummate our relationship. John and Doreen were kind enough to put me up in their guest room. At home, I tried my best to work on my interpersonal skills. Even my boss noticed the difference in my behavior. I joined the company softball team in San Diego. I played doubles tennis on the base courts. Ginny was my partner, and we got along well with new partners. This was my fifth trip to San Diego, three months after my first visit. I walked out of the terminal and into Ginny's car. When I looked back, Kevin's car seat was empty. Where's Kevin? Doreen and John will have him this weekend. I have a surprise for you. I hope you like it, was Ginny's response as she pulled off the side of the road, exited the airport, and drove north on I-5. Ginny didn't tell me anything else about our destination, so we moved on to other things. She told me that Kevin was disappointed that he wouldn't see me until Sunday. He really got attached to me. I could tell Ginny liked it just by the tone of her voice. As we drove, I noticed that Ginny was wearing the same blue dress she wore to our first dinner, but this time she had no bra under her dress. We stopped at the La Jolla Beach and Tennis Resort. She smiled broadly at me. I think it's time, don't you? My answer to her question was a wide grin. As soon as she parked the car, I grabbed her and kissed her. You know I've fallen in love with you again, don't you, Mark? Well, thank God, because I've been hoping you'd do this since that first weekend. I love you, Ginny. What a weekend. Ginny and I ordered room service and made love all Friday night. It's funny, we had sex two of the three years we dated in high school, so you have some expectations of what it will be like. But the passing years had toward us both a thing or two, Thank God, because what we did that night had nothing in common with the bumbling awkwardness of those two teenagers over twelve years ago. We played tennis on Saturday afternoon and made love on Saturday night. On Sunday morning, she surprised the hell out of me by taking us to the nude beach under the cliffs in Torrey Pines. Ginny kept her bikini bottoms but removed her top. I plucked up my courage and took off my swimming trunks for half an hour before, Worried about sunburn, I put them back on. How did you know about this beach? Don't tell me you've done this before. Don't say anything. But Doreen and John come here from time to time. Doreen told me and swore her to secrecy. Now you too have taken the oath. We saw some people watching and even thought about playing volleyball, but decided that maybe next time. I thought that playing volleyball with a group of naked teammates would be a great way to improve my interpersonal and team-building skills. It was early afternoon and time to pick up Kevin. So we headed back to the rocks and headed towards the Clayton house. John greeted me with a firm handshake and a bottle of beer. Doreen hugged me and smiled widely. Kevin hugged my legs. We had dinner with the Claytons, and Kevin spent the entire evening next to me. He looked sad when Ginny dropped me off at the airport. On the way home, I made a decision. Two weeks later, we went back to Clayton's for a Friday night drink. When John and I were alone, I told him, I'm going to ask Ginny to marry me, unless you have a reason why I shouldn't. I would be disappointed if you didn't. She's madly in love with you, and I can't think of a nicer guy or anything that could make her happier. Does this mean she will move to Portland? If she says yes and agrees, I will work to move us back to the Chicagoland area. She misses her parents and siblings. That's great, Mark. I know she talked about her family with Doreen. How are you going to handle this with Kevin? I'm going to invite him to lunch tomorrow and talk. Keep your fingers crossed for me. You might be surprised by his answer. This guy likes you. The next day, Ginny gave me a strange look when I told her that Kevin and I needed to run some errands together. But I got away with it. 
sitting it as a time to bond with the guys. We heated straight to Red Robin and grab at a table. Over two milkshakies, I asked the question. Kevin, what would you say if I asked your mom to marry me? Would it be okay? I held my breath, waiting for his answer. That would be great, Mr. Miller. My mom really likes you. And you, Kevin, do you like me enough that I can live with your mom and you? Yes. Does that make you my father? Something like that. No one could replace your real father. What did you call him? I called him Daddy. Then how about your mom and I get married and you call me Dad? Will this be okay? A sweet smile appeared on Kevin's face and he answered briefly, Of course. We returned to his house. I figured it would be difficult for Kevin to keep our conversation a secret. As soon as we walked through the door, I had a ring in my hand. Kevin was carrying a bouquet of red roses. Ginny smiled when she saw the roses, but looked embarrassed as I fell to my knees. Ginny, will you marry me? Not very original, but right to the point. Ginny fell to her knees and hugged me. Yes, I love you, Mark. That's all I needed to hear. Kevin hugged us. Unfortunately, he forgot to drop the roses first, and the thorns scratched my neck. Fortunately, it was probably the worst thing that happened during the years of our life together. My life with Ginny is blessed in many ways. We got married three months after I proposed. By then, I had found a great sales job at a startup north of Chicago, close enough to our families and our old friends. Kevin now has a brother and a sister. They all call me Pop because that's what Kevin calls me. Ginny still looks amazing after three kids. We still play doubles tennis and please don't tell anyone, but we have learned to play volleyball and play at Black's Beach whenever we visit the Claytons. Last May, our family met with the Clayton clan in Washington. We did the usual tours and on Memorial Day, we visited Chuck's grave in Arlington to pay our respects. Ten years have passed since Captain Turner was taken from his wife and son. It was a sad, dark, and proud day. I was glad John and Doreen were there to help me comfort Kevin and Ginny. It took a whole day for the smile to return, and pain could be seen from time to time for several days. But it was right. To pay our respects to any person, whether in the military, police, or fire department, who willingly lives his life knowing that someday he may have to sacrifice everything in the performance of his duties. We returned from our trip and it took a few weeks, but everything was back to normal, even with a flag, medals, and a photograph of Captain Charles Turner on the bookcase. For me, I'm glad I opened my eyes and ears and learned what trust really is. Even Hank stopped threatening to kick my sorry ass, although he still gets mad at me every time I pass a cutoff man during our softball league games. My excuse is that I was distracted by a beautiful blonde with three cheering children in the stands. My life is good. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Second story. Mr. Chaz Watkins? Damn it, I thought, but I didn't flinch and didn't miss a single line in my conversation with the bartender Kevin. I returned to Texas only six months ago, after three years of exile. How did she find me? And more importantly, why? I didn't turn around and didn't pay any attention to him. I was just about to deliver the punchline of a particularly dirty joke when I felt a hand on my shoulder. Mr. Watkins, my name is Rob Morgan. I was hired to find you. I raised an eyebrow at Kevin and turned my head slightly. Do you want to keep this hand, Robbie? I felt his hand leave my shoulder and turned to Kevin and said my line. He laughed heartily, poured me another shiner bock and said it was in the house, and he walked to the other end of the bar, still giggling. Mr. Watkins, we have business with you. I interrupted him. My name is not Watkins, and I have nothing to do with you unless you want to hire me to cook something. If not, then we have nothing to discuss. Mr. Watt was all he had time to say before he fell to the floor. I put twenty bucks on the counter, massaged my right hand, waved to Kevin, and got up to leave. Mr. Watkins, you are difficult to find, and I do not intend to start the search again. I looked down at the taser he was pointing at me, and even though he was sprawled out on the floor, it was pretty scary. When he stood up, he wiped a trickle of blood from the corner of his mouth. 
I have no doubts about the use of this device. So take a seat and let's chat. I looked at Kevin, who was heading our way, and waved to him. He paused, nodded, and then said, Let me know if you need anything, Bill. Thank you, Kevin. I will do so. I turned around and looked at the asshole with the stun gun. Who carries a stun gun in Texas? I grinned and leaned a little closer to him. Do I know you, guy? Your manners need work, son. You couldn't have been raised in Texas. Why don't you call me Bill and then tell me who you are and what you need? Bill. Yes? Okay. Bill. Kevin. Organize a couple of beers for us and put it on Robbie's account. I smiled, sat down in the nearest booth and asked, So why don't you tell me who this Watkins guy is and why he's such a big stick in your ass? Okay, Bill. We'll play it your way. At least for now. Mr. Chaz Watkins was a successful, wealthy Dallas businessman who disappeared without a trace just over three years ago. He is married to Mrs. Amy Watkins, and they have one daughter, Sarah, aged 23 years. My name is, as I said, Rob Morgan. I was hired to find Chaz Watkins and bring him back to Dallas. Is it true? Three years, you say, and without a trace? What does this have to do with me? It looks like you mistook me for him, but I'm not Chaz Watkins or a successful businessman. My name is Bill Grant. I weld metal for money, play a little guitar, poorly, and travel a little. I was so careful. Before I left, I paid a ton of money for a completely new identity. Since then, I've grown my hair and beard, lost about 30 pounds of fat, and added about 20 pounds of muscle. Amy wouldn't recognize me even if I spat on her. When I left Dallas, I drove north and west for three days, stopped, found a trailer to rent, signed up for a welding class at a local community college, and started my life again. I left everything in Dallas except my money, a high-paying job, two houses, cars, credit cards, keys, cell phone, clothes, and a lying, cheating wife. I paid cash for a used Ford F-150, registered it under my new name, and drove it to the music store where I bought a used but beautiful Martin Dreadnought guitar. I took nothing with me except my clothes. I rarely stayed in one place for more than six to eight months and always paid in cash. I had no credit cards or cell phone. I worked for cash, under the table, didn't file a tax return, and almost always stayed out of trouble. It must have been Sarah. I couldn't cross it out completely. About 15 or 16 months after I left, I sent her a letter to let her know I was alive. I sent her another one, before every move, from my computer at the public library, just to let her know that I loved her and was thinking about her. I never told her where I was or why I left, and I did not answer her questions on either topic. She could get that out of her mother. Well, Bill, Robbie grinned. As I said, a little over three years ago, Mr. Watkins just up and disappeared, and no one seemed to know anything about it. For the first year or so, the police followed it up, in my opinion, rather casually, and many suspected that he had either run off with another woman or that he was the subject of foul play on the part of Mrs. Watkins. It has been a difficult year for Mrs. Watkins, personally, professionally, financially. She tried to liquidate some of their assets, but she didn't have power of attorney and couldn't get Mr. Watkins declared dead, so she was stuck. There was money in the bank, but little new money was coming in, so she spent it pretty quickly. She hired a lawyer who helped her declare her husband dead. Unfortunately for Mrs. Watkins, about 16 months after her husband's disappearance, their daughter Sarah received an email from a man claiming to be Mr. Watkins. The daughter, of course, was happy, but declaring Mr. Watkins dead was not an easy matter. At this point, the police closed the case, and Mrs. Watkins hired my firm to find Mr. Chas Watkins and bring him to Dallas to face fraud charges so that Mrs. Watkins could have sole access and control of the family assets. Poor thing, I chuckled. Looks like she's in some trouble. So tell me, Robbie, how do I fit into this little made-for-TV movie? Well, Mr. Watkins, can I call you Chaz? You can call me Bill like everyone else. I am authorized by the state of Texas, if necessary, to compel you, Chaz Watkins, to appear before the Dallas County Sheriff 
to answer charges of fraud and child abandonment. I laughed out loud to his annoyance. That's too strong a word for a little guy, Robbie. Your story is sweet, but what kind of fraud was committed? When did abandoning a marriage become a crime in Texas, and why does the Dallas County Sheriff care? I'd say if you ever find this Chaz Watkins, you'll have to do a better job of intimidating him. He doesn't seem stupid to me. I think it's very difficult to convince him that he should come back to Dallas, and I suspect that if he just left, he had a good reason. Let me help you with a little role play, Robbie. Why should he come back? What will happen to him for this? I think you'll have to dig pretty deep to find the answer to these questions. I emptied my bottle of beer and took a sip. You can put away your little laser pointer now, Robbie. Under the table, I pulled the bolt of my Glock. He really should pay more attention to people. He lost his color a little, knowing there was a round in the chamber of the 9mm pistol pointed at him and carefully brought the stun gun to the spot on the table I was pointing at. I would like to tell you a story, Robbie. A friend of mine told me this story about three years ago, I would say. Are you listening? Fine. How about another couple of beers and a basket of wings, Kevin? My friend, Robbie, is paying here. There was this guy I met about three years ago, let's call him Chaz. He was married to a woman, let's call her Amy, and coincidentally, they had a daughter named Sarah. This is the story my friend Chaz told me. I can tell you when my marriage ended or at least at the moment when I realized that he was doomed. It was Amy's 50th birthday. We decided to celebrate her 50th birthday at our country house over the weekend, just the two of us. She had always been a quiet woman who was not interested in parties or elaborate events. We are fairly well off, and so she had everything she needed and wanted. This made gift-giving difficult, but I spent months thinking about what to give her, felt her in conversations, polled her friends, and was happy with the gifts I chose for her. She obviously doesn't. This became clear as soon as she saw them. Her face dropped. Just for a moment before a mask of forced gratitude appeared, as she thanked me. By that time, we had been married for 24 years, and I thought I knew her well, but it was obvious to me that she expected something completely different. I pondered this thought for a while, and then asked her how she really felt. She assured me that she was happy, but her smile was forced. I pressed the matter, and she finally admitted that the gifts weren't what she expected, and she was hoping for something more. Well, she wasn't sure what, just not this. If she didn't know, then how the hell could I know? I apologized for ruining such an important event for her, and said that I would do my best to make amends. She told me that I could make amends if I wanted, but she was very surprised that her 50th birthday was not celebrated with more consideration on my part. Yes, I tried to explain to her the reason for each gift, but the more I talked, the more irritated she became. In the end, I promised to make amends, to which she replied, If you had thought of me first, you wouldn't have to try to make amends, and how can you make amends for such a mistake? I will never turn 50 again. Then she told me she wasn't feeling well and wanted to go home to Dallas. We drove home in silence, both seething with anger. We were almost never married. We were in a long-distance relationship while I was in college. She is three years older than me and has already graduated. And when I visited her for a long weekend, I caught Amy cheating. We were walking through the city center when we were stopped by a tall, elderly man, about 50 years old, who hugged her affectionately. Amy introduced the two of us, and when he shook my hand, he grinned. He grinned. He had a weak handshake, and my father taught me to always be careful around people who have a weak handshake. My vigilance was at its best, and I immediately stopped liking him. Nice to meet you, Dan. Are you a friend of Amy's father? I couldn't figure out what it was, but something wasn't right. Amy was a little excited, and he was acting a little smug. While she was at work that day, I did some digging and found out that they had been dating for about a month. I found their love letters, damn it. She didn't even hide it. We agreed to be exclusive. When I asked her about this, she, of course, denied everything. They were only friends. I told her to fuck off and immediately left. I didn't call or write to her. I didn't answer her calls. I threw her letters in the trash without reading them. Her friends started calling and I ignored them. 
Then she made my friends call me and beg for reconciliation. I asked them all to tell her not to worry that she can now freely have sex and marry her grandfather. I fucking hate it when people lie to me. Eventually, she came to me and over time, she was able to convince me to give her a second chance. I gave in but kept her on a short leash for a very long time and told her in no uncertain terms that if she cheated on me one more time, then it was all over between us. Two years later, we got married. She never admitted to cheating. After 11 years of marriage, Amy threatened to divorce me. I drank too much, worked too much, traveled too much, and she no longer wanted to share her life with me. We had a fight. I told her that while I couldn't limit my travel, I could cut back on work a little and, of course, limit my drinking. I begged her to think about our little daughter, Sarah. She eventually agreed, but I was saddled with some pretty tight restrictions, and she began to separate our finances and lives. She told me she was just preparing for the inevitable. I pointed out to her that she didn't really seem to want it, and she just shrugged and left the room. However, I was determined, and over the next few years, she relaxed. Mainly, I think, because I began to earn several times more than she did. In fact, I paid more taxes than she earned in a year. And separate finances only benefited me, allowing me to pursue my own interests without having to discuss something with her. I bought a couple of motorcycles, a large sailboat, took flying lessons, and bought a Cessna airplane. I wore designer suits and drove a late model BMW. I bought our second home in the countryside, a secluded place on 50 acres, without any financial help from her. I was always the first contributor to the household, paid for all the family vacations, and yet I lived a life that she wanted a bigger piece of. So she relaxed. I'm not sure we ever truly recovered from this episode. Two years ago, I was close to divorcing her. Over the years, Amy became more aggressive towards me. She became obstinate, and I became her subordinate. We rarely had sex, maybe twice a year, and when we did, it was more like we were both scratching an itch. There was no intimacy, no love. I was sure she had been cheating on me for years, but I had no proof. I don't think she had any long-term affairs, just a lot of one-night stands while she was traveling for work. She became better at cheating and hiding it. Our daughter had just left for college, and one evening, after a rather unpleasant and public attack on my character and attractiveness, I had had enough and gave her an ultimatum. Either we work on becoming a stronger, more loving couple with a better communication and an active, full-fledged sex life, or we go different ways. I no longer wanted to live as people who simply tolerated each other's presence. I had to file for divorce from her before she agreed to talk. We argued for days, and it was the first time in years that we actually communicated. She didn't want a divorce. This surprised me, and I told her about it. She promised that she would return to our relationship and work on her part of the marriage. I was skeptical, feeling that she actually wanted my money, but I loved her and eventually gave in. So we agreed on new rules of engagement and communication and set about fixing our marriage. I took the lead and pushed her, and although she seemed content to travel down this road with me, I always felt as if I was chauffeuring Miss Daisy's car. She was in the back seat admiring the scenery while I did everything. Hard work. After a year, I told her that I wanted her to sit in the front seat with me and drive the car sometimes. She agreed, but stubbornly continued to sit in the back seat. Of course, she had her list of complaints, and I listened to them, acknowledged them, and began trying to resolve each of them. I loved her. And although she rarely initiated anything to improve our marriage, she participated in everything I suggested, and the situation improved. We began to communicate better and have much more rewarding and frequent sex, maybe twice a week, sometimes more. She wasn't as sexually adventurous as she was at the beginning of our marriage, but she was willing to try new things and seemed content. I relaxed. We were happy, but I also knew she was holding back. A few weeks passed after her 50th birthday, and it seemed that things were becoming increasingly frosty between us. The affection weakened at least on her part, and the sex gradually dried up. When I asked Amy about it, she blamed it on work stress and promised that when her schedule calmed down, everything would go back to normal. But that did not happen. She always had to work long hours in the middle of projects, so at first I didn't see anything alarming about late nights. But then it started to dawn on me that this seemed more extreme than usual and that I was spending more weekends alone at our country house. 
However, she always had a plausible excuse, so I decided to just wait a little longer. Over the next six weeks, we only had sex twice, both times at my insistence, and both times she seemed to just tolerate it while I came. Immediately after one love-making session, in which she barely participated, she turned over on her back, and another time, she simply left the room. In the evenings and on weekends, she did everything she could to avoid me. When this was impossible or difficult, she seemed bored at best, but more often just irritated. I remember this picture. The shrew has returned. Part of our job over the previous two years was to discuss any issues that came up before they escalated into fights, and if we did fight, to try to be better, more productive in our conflicts. Remaining as impersonal as possible, we persisted in pursuing a solution, always trying to see the other side. We did not tolerate excuses, excuses or non-participation. We have always acknowledged the feelings of the injured party and tried to resolve only these issues. No evasions, avoidances, or accusations. When I told her about her schedule, lack of affection, and our dead sex life, she didn't want to discuss it. Over the course of several days, she put the conversation off several times, and when I pointed out that she was not playing by our new rules of interaction and communication, she told me to shove the rules up my ass and leave her alone. I suppressed my anger and, between clenched teeth, reminded her that we had agreed that these rules were important and not negotiable. She told me to fuck off and continue to negotiate with my right hand. Message received, loud and clear. Did she cheat on me? Maybe. I didn't need to know. Texas is a no-fault state, but I wanted to know. It was clear that our marriage was over, and if that was the case... Her cheating didn't change much, but I hate being lied to, and this time, she would pay for it. I often reminded her that I thought about loyalty and honesty. I understand that you can't choose who you're attracted to, but you can choose what to do about it. I told her that if she was so attracted to someone else that she couldn't help herself, we would get a divorce first. It will hurt me but I will respect her for respecting me enough to wait until we get divorced and be honest with me. We could have parted amicably, sort of. And I promised to do the same for her. I needed to know for sure. And I needed to do something. Before we combined our finances, about eight years prior, I moved some of my money into an investment account. I have also made arrangements with my employer to have all my bonuses deposited into this new account. I never told my wife about this, mainly because she wanted control of our finances and I thought I could invest better than her. It turned out that I was right, and my investment portfolio became very healthy. One of the benefits offered by my long-term employer was tax return preparation and filing, and this was the one area where my wife and I never saw eye to eye. At her insistence, we started filing our taxes separately 13 years ago, and she didn't see any real benefit in changing that, so we didn't. I suspected that she was hiding money and decided that this would allow me to hide this investment account from her. I planned to surprise her with money in retirement if we made it that far. The way I see it, if she hadn't cheated and we got divorced, I would have happily divided all of our assets, but if she had cheated, well, that was a different matter. I had to figure out how to protect this money. She will not be rewarded for her betrayal and dishonesty. I also had to figure out how to gain control of our joint accounts, sell our house in Dallas. It was in my name only, but she loved it, and try to keep our vacation property. I loved the place. We planned to retire there, and I didn't want to give it to her or sell it. Of course, if it looked like I couldn't keep it for myself, I would make her sell it before I let her take it. I paid for it, furnished it, and maintained it for ten years. As far as I understand, she simply had no right to it. If I had to, I would give her the house in Dallas. I wanted to get rid of him just because she loved him so much, but I would give up that pleasure if it meant I could keep my country house. This would take time, and I wasn't sure she wasn't just going to serve me soon, so I immediately got to work. The first thing I needed to do was contact a lawyer. One of my old college buddies was a corporate lawyer here in Dallas. I called him and asked him to meet with me, 
and he readily agreed. We met at a road cafe near his office that evening, and over dinner and a couple of beers, I explained my situation and asked for a referral to a family law attorney, as well as his personal and legal views on my situation. His legal advice was sobering. Basically, I was completely screwed. If I divorced her, there would be no way to protect my property from her. In any case, no legal means. And while there was still a healthy network of good guys in Texas that didn't condone cheating wives, no guilt meant I could get a 50-50 split with a little alimony for Amy. It doesn't matter who did what. If she cheated on me, then no harm, nothing bad. Give her half of everything you have and let her move her boyfriend into your house while you pay her child support. He advised me from a legal standpoint if it affects the status of my marriage to do nothing. I just blinked at him. He smiled and said, Don't divorce her, change the equation. Find out if she's cheating and if so, then strip what you can take with you. Let her file for divorce and try to get back everything you take with her. He referred me to a shark lawyer who specialized in family law. She was the only lawyer he feared if he and his wife were getting a divorce. This was plan B. She kept avoiding me and I let her. I no longer asked about her schedule, her weekends, our sex life, or our lack of intimacy, and she seemed to take that as a victory. It's like I just accepted the new situation. Now I spent most of my time in our country house and rarely saw her. This seemed to please her. My new divorce lawyer met with me and helped me change the beneficiaries in my will, insurance policies, etc. She also suggested that I hire a private investigator because, as she said, Texas may be innocent, but there's nothing like a little visual carnal evidence to push negotiations in the right direction. I agreed. She recommended a former police officer who ran an agency that she had used for some time with great success and asked her assistant to contact him to set up a meeting. He saw me the same day. I paid for the Daylux package, and our entire life was equipped with audio and video. Within a few days, they had learned the who, when, and how long, and were working to obtain video evidence that my lawyer thought could help me if it came to a divorce. A week later, I sat and watched the video evidence. It was more devastating than I thought, and even Plan B disappeared from my thoughts. Sex didn't seem like a big deal to me. He wasn't any more gifted than me, or in better shape. He didn't have the best techniques or even excite her, for the most part. She didn't do anything to him that she hadn't done to me, but her date took every opportunity to verbally put me down, and she participated enthusiastically, even suggesting they have sex in my bed next time, which they did. I didn't know this woman, and wondered if I had ever really known her, feeling empty. Knowing that your spouse is cheating and seeing him cheat are two completely different things. I have no strength left to fight. I sealed the videotape and gave it to my lawyer for safekeeping, with instructions to give it to my daughter in the event of my death. I prepaid Sarah's college tuition until graduation from our joint savings account and then liquidated my investment account. I myself lived on what I had from my investment account, and it would have lasted me for years without being frugal. And now, our joint savings account was seriously depleted. Two weeks later, I looked around the house one last time, sighed, and came to terms with my decision. I left my keys, cell phone, and wallet on the table in the foyer where I always left them. I took off my wedding ring and threw it on the pillow that was on my side of the bed. Let her think about it. Then I left. I didn't talk to anyone, didn't leave letters. I walked out the front door without even bothering to close it, walked around the corner, got into my new pickup truck, and drove away. Two weeks later, a 40-year-old married man and father of three was robbed and severely beaten while leaving a motel. He was able to walk again, but only after some time, and then with a pronounced limp. A month after the robbery, his wife received a FedEx package containing a video of her husband having sex with a woman who appeared to be in her 50s. As I understand it, they divorced a year later, and he was broke. After I left, I drove aimlessly for three days. I didn't have any plans. Finally, one day I stopped in a small town for lunch and decided to stay for a while. I found a small community college that offered welding courses and enrolled. Why not? 
After 12 months, I managed to find a job as a welder at an auto repair shop. I only had a year of training, so I couldn't get a real welding job. But I found a lot of people willing to hire the guy for cash, since it was a lot cheaper than a certified welder. And most welders were not interested in the small jobs I took. I enjoyed my job there for another four months before I decided it was time to move on. For the next two years, I traveled around the country, occasionally stopping in small towns. For the first time in many years, I enjoyed life. I hated my job in Dallas. The money was fantastic, but although I was a natural and good at it, I found it difficult to get up every morning to spend another day doing it. I did this for my family. Amy expected it and Sarah deserved it. Amy liked money, which meant she could play saint by working for a non-profit organization that was paid pennies to help other people. In fact, the organization she worked for consisted mostly of the wives of wealthy businessmen who wanted something to do and be seen doing. All of their fundraising events were featured in the local Who's Who newspaper, and the dresses the employees wore cost more than most of their clients earned in a year of hard work. It was pathetic, and most of the money raised went to fund the next charity event. Basically, they helped themselves feel better. Meanwhile, I was working my ass off at a job I hated because I loved my family, and that was what was expected of me. When I left, I decided that from now on, I would do everything only for myself. During these three years, I had sex with several women. I enjoyed it and sincerely hoped that they did too, but I was doing it for myself. I had no intention of settling down, and if they became too intrusive or difficult, I simply turned them off. I wanted to get laid, not find a freen or soul mate. Since then, I haven't looked back and don't plan to. I don't know what happened to Amy, the house, or the 50 acres of land in the village, and I don't care. She has chosen her path in life, and if she is happy with her decision, then I can live with that. I secretly hope she's miserable and penniless, but I won't go out of my way to make that happen. I'd like to see my daughter again someday, but only if she promises not to tell Amy. So far, it is difficult for her to make such a promise. I keep hoping. As far as I understand, Robbie, my friend, is happy now. He left his cheating wife and miserable job and doesn't think about his old life. Why should he come back? To pay her to make him miserable and let her make him miserable again? It just doesn't make sense to him. He is happy, healthy, and rich in all the areas that matter. His wife and his marriage to her made him unhappy. When he finally woke up and gave in, he realized that the only two good things that came out of it were his daughter and, ultimately, his freedom. He finally realized that, in fact, he was the only one in this marriage. You know, he told me that after he left and tried several other women, he realized that even in bed, she wasn't that good. Looking back, he realized that she had never, not once, brought her A-game to the marriage. She played with him for 24 fucking years. This doesn't seem like something worth staying or coming back for. Hey, Kev, how about a couple more beers? He told me that he felt his wife was a narcissistic narcissist, and so he decided that the cruelest thing he could do to her was to ignore her. He didn't want her to see his pain so she could feed off of it and feel like she mattered because of it. Indifference was the key. It would have killed her. But how could he be around her and be indifferent? He decided that if he just left everything, he would thereby tell her that he was indifferent not only to her, but to their entire life together. He decided that it might take years, but eventually she would stumble and fail, and he would win. Robbie sighed and nodded. You're an interesting person, Bill, and it's a good story. Where is your friend now? I shrugged. God knows, Robbie. He's having fun somewhere or cooking something. Definitely not working hard for an ungrateful, cheating wife. I think he's probably in Wisconsin. He told me he always wanted to see Wisconsin. Wherever he is, I'm sure he's happy and doesn't want to change anything. Tell me, why doesn't your friend Mrs. Watkins just file for divorce on the grounds of child abandonment. Wouldn't this give her the control over the marital assets that she so badly wants? I think this is a simple solution to her problem, and then you can stop looking for this Chaz 
and pissing off complete strangers in the process. There are no more assets to take control of, Bill. She tried to file to leave the family, but because she tried to have him declared dead first, by the time she got around to filing, she had lost her home, her vacation property, and her job. What are you saying? What happened and why are you still looking for this guy? Well, she ran out of money, couldn't afford the property on her salary, and since she couldn't sell it, both properties were repossessed. The house was bought by an elderly retired couple, and the country estate was bought by a company called CWW LLC, which is some kind of metal art consulting company. Mrs. Watkins lost her job when it was discovered she was having an affair with a married employee. Wow, that's not what she wanted, is it, Robbie? He nodded. Well, I'm certainly sorry I wasted your time, Bill, but I almost enjoyed meeting you. He took 40 bucks out of his wallet, threw them on the table, stood up and extended his hand to me. No hard feelings. None, I said, but in the future you should be careful with those you upset. You're lucky I'm such a patient guy. He laughed as he turned to leave. He took about six steps before stopping and, without turning around, asked, Bill? Yes? For that matter, Amy still loves him. She is sorry and hopes to get him back. She's depressed, drinks too much, and can't cope. Women like her don't know what love is, Robbie. They love themselves, and they love what other people give them. They are consumers and are unable to think about others. They are greedy and vile, and deserve whatever suffering they bring upon themselves through their mistreatment of others. If she was sorry, she wouldn't continue to have sex with other men. Her only regret is that she is not provided with the opportunity for people to find out the truth about her. She regrets that she was caught and that the money dried up. If she was truly sorry, she might think about her daughter's feelings and how she is suffering without a relationship with her father. She could have thought about what she put her husband through and left him alone. She doesn't deserve him, but she won't admit it. In her twisted, sick little world, she is the center of the universe, and reality, responsibility, love, respect, and honesty only work when they align with her goals. He and his daughter deserve better, don't you think? He slowly turned to face me. Shay? Yes, Bob? Wisconsin can be cold in the winter, but I know Sarah likes it there. Maybe CWW LLC should move its office to Racine? Thank you, Bob. Maybe. Everything is possible. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.